we've had several conversations and my question is how do we engage people in owning their own health care and how to how do we get them to participate in setting up cooperatives how do we make the cooperatives happen and you and I have had that conversation several times but well I have a pretty strong feeling about how it can be done uh, my basic uh, observations over the last 40 years I've been representing physicians in their contracts with insurance companies and HMOs uh, for the last 45 years just about and it's always been a paternalistic system in the sense that the patients uh, are not actively seeking the care of physicians, nor are they actively seeking any basic information about health care for their own sake or know much about it. I mean, the literacy in, in medicine is very low among adults and children, and we don't teach anybody anything about uh, anatomy and physiology and medicine and chemistry and things like that at the ages that they should begin learning that, which would be as a, just like we teach them reading and writing when they're four or five years old and every year thereafter. And if we did that, then the patients would, would have more power to take care of themselves and then could choose wisely the people they want to advise them and treat them. And since we sort of skipped over that in, in our culture and maybe across the world, because medicine has been reserved because of its complexity and and the art involved in it to a very small number of people, an elite class of people such as yourself. And that's okay, but it's not okay if there's not enough of you in that class to, to be available to teach and to bring all the rest of the patients to the table and, um, and, and restore some, like, some help. Well, as the years have passed, uh, the problems that we see in taking care of our own families and in the use of the medical system the way it is and in the mixing of medical care advice with financing, banking, and stuff such as that, which we've done through insurance, has made it further complicated because it gives people, both patients and physicians, incentives to do something other than attend to knowing what's wrong with them and attend to what the problems are that uh, would solve their pain and suffering. So I had to rethink what I was doing in life and say, well, why don't I start this thing all over again in some way by organizing the patients to say, we all know that we have one thing in common pretty easily, you know, common sense tells us that all of us have our health or our sickness in common. We share that experience, all of us. But we don't necessarily have our philosophies and our beliefs and our social behavior and our neighborhoods and all that stuff. We don't have that in common. And so organizing around something other than health itself and the desire to know it is diversionary. It, it, it probably doesn't get us to where we need to be. So I said, well, what if we started by saying all us patients come together and see what we need and want and then agree that whatever we need and want that we as a group of patients will be responsible for paying for it. Then seek the physicians and ask them if they will participate with us as educators and as healers and as teachers and as uh, people that are there for us for enough time whenever it's needed to solve the problems that we're facing. Now the evidence that what we're doing right now that it's not working is coming from the very large number of people that are dying in the United States as a consequence of medical care they're receiving. 
And I think last week there was a report from the CDC that that number, they put it about 400,000 a year related to hospitalizations or relating to the kind of care and treatment that they got when they went to the hospital, uh, mistakes that are made, medicines that are prescribed uh, only, or surgical procedures or infections they get. The number has been reported to be higher than that in the past. It's been as much as 750 to 800,000. So I was pleased to have met your acquaintance and know that one of your goals in Veritas was to take on the challenge of how we can have a, you know, a way to avoid any causes of uh, injury or death because of medicine by simply focusing on it. And then beyond that, recognizing that the more we know as patients and the more we know, uh, the earlier we know it, the more likely we are to, to have a big impact on that uh, mortality rate in spite of uh, in spite of any other things we might do. If we did the education first, we might lower the, the death rate uh, enormously just on that basis alone. And that's all in the, in the public health sector. So what I wanted to, the problem that I was faced with is how do we have a healthcare system that's patient-centric and guided by the physicians that are capable of, of bringing us to the level of understanding necessary to have good health care. And the way to organize it, from my experience, has been for the physician to be active in communicating to his patients the need for that patient to join with him or her in their particular practice. All of the patients become payers of health care on some sort of direct payment plan or direct payment system, and that way the financial aspects of seeing a doctor are taken care of and eliminated. And even within somebody's practice, I've noticed historically, physicians I've known in the past, have taken care of all their patients, whether those patients could pay or not. And that, that's never been a burden because generally the patients that uh, could pay more paid a little bit more and those that couldn't pay as much paid a little less and those that couldn't pay at all were just taken care of. So when it comes to primary care, I've found that the spirit in among physicians was such that that was easily taken care of. Then we ran a little experiment because I was doing uh, contracting for a practice association for HMOs, and the experiment was that we would sponsor a free clinic because they, a lot of people had patients come to them that were not insured and didn't have money and, and needed health care, and were used to seeking it from public uh, health facilities and from free clinics. So we opened a free clinic, and we had a couple of doctors that volunteered and worked at the clinic, and we interviewed about 4,000 patients as they were seeing them over a period of about a year and a half. These 4,000 patients were asked, uh, if you could pay for this service, how much would you be willing to pay? And the answer came back as much as $50. And, and it was not per episode or per care, per treatment. It was per month. How would you pay per month to get this anytime you wanted it? And the answer was anywhere from $20 to $50, but the average was about $30. That, that anybody walking in off the street that didn't have a job maybe or had low income and didn't have insurance thought that they could pay $30 a month to get the care they needed from a physician when they needed it. So I, we thought about that and we said, well, how much do doctors make right now that are in primary care? How much, when they, if they collected $30 a month from every one of their patients, and they saw a patient every 20 minutes, five days a week, which is you know three an hour, how much would they make? And they would, under those circumstances, they will see about 1,500 patients in a year, sometimes a little less, but that seems to be about what a 20 minute visit turns into if it's five days a week and eight hours a day. So we said, if that's the case, then if every patient paid $30, then that physician would have a gross income of $45,000 a month. 
Well, we checked, and the Houston doctor that we knew, and this has been about four years ago that we did that, didn't make that much money. They didn't gross $45,000 a month. They were grossing less than that. So payment, direct payment from patients at $30 a month per patient was more than doctors collected from insurance companies and any, and Medicare and Medicaid and everybody all combined. Plus, there was no claims filing. There was a lot of things that were eliminated when you had that direct payment. So we thought, well, well, let's try it. Let's see it. And we had some physicians start doing that in their practices, and they didn't convert everybody, but some of them converted as much as 700 to 800 patients in their practice and found out that those patients were happier, there was less hassle, and they made more money from it. But so, it was not a burden for patient. So these were a mix of patients who were uninsured, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and, and all of them were willing to pay, the average that they were willing to pay was $50 well, we've, a month. We've had pay, in that group, when this physician started doing it, and he was in North Carolina when he started, he, uh, he had a, an urgent care clinic, and there were two physicians and two nurse practitioners working there. And he just started enrolling his patients by telling them when they came in, they either had no insurance or they had high deductible insurance or they were on Medicare and they had deductibles and co-insurance or they were buying a Medicare supplement or something like that. And so he charged them a membership fee to be in his association and then the $30 a month for his medical care. So they were paying around, I think in his case, they were paying around $45 a month because the $15 was administrative cost of, of dealing with the association there. And, uh, and he had, in six months, he had 780 people sign up. And he's continued that, and it works very well. And he was, it was the patients, you would think it was just the, the very poor that were doing that, but there was a big cross-section of the, of the patient population that did it people that were had insurance included but had high deductibles on their insurance or just wanted a concierge service. I mean, they didn't really care and just didn't want to bother with insurance at all on it. So it, it turned out to be a blessing in a, in a way that we didn't expect it. And the patients were overly gratified at that service. So we just kept working on that, that program to see, well, what is it, what kind of problems do you run into if the patients are aligned with just you as an individual provider and they don't have access to anybody else because we know that a, a one physician isn't enough for even one patient because they get problems that go beyond the, the expertise of the general practitioner or the internist or any particular physician. And they, and, and they might need the attendance of an OBGYN or they might need a surgeon or they might need a, an eye doctor or an ophthalmologist or anything like that. So how do you get them to get those services without any barriers so that your physician could comfortably refer one of his member patients to somebody outside of his office? So we said, well, we could ask the specialists that are in our IPA in Houston or our association if they would accept uh, whatever the patient's insurance was or their Medicare or Medicaid if they had those if they had those kinds of insurance and we found that yes most of them would do it if they knew in advance what was, it was coming from one of the primary care people that typically referred to them and then as we grew we found that well we needed to have the availability of physicians that were specialists and also hospitals that would also accept these patients for referrals and we found a, a company out of New York called Multiplan that had contracts with 900,000 providers, almost all the hospitals and all the physicians, you know, specialist physicians in the United States. And so we made a deal to pay them a, a small fee, a capitation fee of about 2 or $3 a month. And any patient that goes to any of those member Multiplan doctors will have guaranteed access and they'll have a guaranteed price and that doctor will accept their insurance. 
So that sort of move, removed a barrier that was troublesome for some of the physicians that wanted to do this kind of club or this kind of membership association because now they didn't have to worry about the patient having access. And we said, well, if that works for the specialist, I wonder what we could do for laboratory because laboratory is a big expense for people that don't have insurance to cover it or don't have some way to get it done by the doctor's own contracts. So we went to uh, clinical pathology laboratories and we made a deal with them for the patients to pay them $2 a month, a member, and they can get whatever labs they needed. And then we expanded it because CPL was not everywhere and so we made a contract with Quest, and so the patients of the primary care physicians actually have a choice of whether their patient uses Quest or uses CPL. But that means we get all laboratory done for $2. Then we had to go find pharmacy for people because that's sort of the third expense that's difficult to manage on a routine basis. And we found a, a discount program, a national discount program that gave us about 60% off of the average wholesale price for pharmaceuticals. And then we found that some people had availability of the 340B programs from some of the uh, federally qualified clinics that are in a lot of the metropolitan areas in Houston, and they could actually get the drugs prescribed from and through that uh, federally qualified clinic. So we just chipped away at what was necessary. Then we had to find out what do people do that have no insurance and don't have enough money to pay for it through the exchange or through the commercial insurance or they've been excluded from getting it for some reason, timing was wrong, they didn't enroll at the right time. And we went to an insurance company and asked them if they would write a group insurance policy for the association members that didn't have pre-existing condition exclusions and would cover them for uh, you know, routine medical care for the specialist and hospital cost, and then for catastrophic care for the reinsurance cost. And we found that from uh, Pan American Life, and uh, which is an A-rated company, and we found the stop-loss insurance available from Presidio, one of their subsidiary companies called Partners Re, that covers up to $5 million. And these were, were not much cheaper than market, but about... 20 or 25 percent, the overall program was about 20 or 25 percent cheaper than the, uh, than the exchange uh, that people have available to them now through the Accountable Care Act. So we believe that, that by starting with the patient, starting at the home base, making the alignment with the physicians, and then filling in all those extra needs that are exceptions rather than the rule in, get, in paying for medical care, getting medical care, but paying for it, that, uh, that we've developed a comprehensive program that can be used by anybody that wants to do it, any physician office in the country that wanted to organize and his own, their own patients to do this would be able to solidify their patient relationship and stabilize the market and probably fix this healthcare system. Now, what if, what, what if um, a single patient came to me and said, how can we set up a co-op here in rural Maine? Well, I, I, you know, we, I just had some conversations with some physicians you introduced me to in, in Pennsylvania, and I finally talked them into, why don't you just ask one patient at a time in your practice if they want to do this, and that one patient will be your first co-op member. I mean, the co-op is already established. Just use it. It's not. It's a free deal. It's in the sense that it's a nonprofit. There, there's nothing in it except uh, paying your doctor and paying for things that you want to begin with. And so, any physician can become sort of the the point of service or the the point of contact for using that association and using the you know the physician network. And, of course, it's always nice to have other physicians in the community, particularly the specialists, who know what you're doing and cooperate with you. And they don't have to worry about they, – they quit thinking about it being insurance and thinking about it being as just patient care among their friends and with, other, with their other colleagues. 
no, so that's that's the way it's done. It's not. It doesn't take. You know, going to organizations and employers and churches and things like that does not solve anything necessarily, because as I said in 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 the beginning, what we have in common is our health and health care. We don't have our religions in common. We don't have our employers in common. And when you bring them into the picture as the organizing units to bring health care to patients, it's diversionary for the employer and it's diversionary for the church. They have a different mission. And the employers have a different mission. And when they make the decisions about where you get health care, whom you get it from, and what its benefits are going to be, it'll always be from their point of view, which will be convenience or economics. But it's not the patient's point of view, and it's not the physician's point of view. It's the employer's point of view, or that church organization's point of view. So, do we have a, do we have a document that somebody would sign? That, oh yeah. So 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 an individual patient. Let's say tomorrow, I got a phone call from a patient that said, I, "You know, I really think we should do this co-op." Um, right. We do have, we, we have a vetted document that was prepared by the attorneys and checked to see that it was compliant. And of course, a lot of doctors have concierge programs and that's the document they use. It's just a payment agreement between the physician and the patient. And then they can join the patient association and they can get the other products that they might need, such as access to other doctors for referrals and guaranteed prices. And so the contract is on a little application form that they'd fill out for their membership, and then it includes the contract with their doctor for payment. And we can start anybody, anytime. So if a patient, if a patient comes to me and says, I'd like to set up that co-op, let's set up the co-op in, in Maine tomorrow, and I could, I could uh, refer them to uh, what document would they sign? What would they do? What would be the next step for them? Let's say I we, we share this video with uh, the Society for Participatory Medicine and they say, well, you know, this is great, but these are people from all over the country and it's actually a global organization. It's not huge, it's about 300 to 400 people, but they're from all over the world. And and um, some of them are going to say, yeah, we sh we should do that. So so what what do you and I do to give them the uh, specific direction that they need to actually set up a co-op for for themselves and for the people in their area. Can, there, there's some state regulation about contracting for discounts from doctors or prices from doctors and arranging these contracts between the patients and doctors. And they, they have, uh, in different states, it's uh, called different things, but in Texas, it's uh, they license you as a discount medical organization, they call it. Now, there's no, there's no insurance involved in that. They're just saying that you can't be somebody that negotiates prices for patients without be having a bond, you know, we, we, because they don't want, they want to know who's doing that. And that's true of other states too. So whenever you go from one state to another, you always have to see which department is regulating that particular license and you have to file for approval and get that license. And it's a short process. It takes about 30 days to get it approved. We've done it only in, uh, four states so far, Texas and uh, North Carolina and uh, Oregon and, uh, and California. In California, it falls under the Knox Keene Act and the uh, Department of, of uh, Managed Care, and that's one of their licenses in that department. And uh, so you just have to do that in every state. Now, there are a few states in which it did matter, but uh, almost all of them will have that. And we we're, we make application in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York, and, and uh, the East Coast uh, states here over the next few months. So can we? So so it sounds like each each uh, state or 
community actually has to create an entity, a legal entity, uh, from which... No, no, we, we have a legal entity that is that cooperative, and they could be a chapter of that one entity, and that way we just have to have one licensed entity, and it helps because if you've been approved in one state, and your records have been examined and your bond has been posted, then they just check with the state where you're approved. But if you're a new entity coming up, then they have to go back and look at everything that you filed in that state. So it, and, it, and then it's your separate entity. But if we use the same entity, it'll move a little faster. And it doesn't matter. It's not a for-profit entity to begin with. And, it, and, and the local chapter would claim you know, all of the revenue that would come into it for administrative services and things like that. So it, it doesn't it doesn't conflict with what you would do if you were separate up separate entities, but it it's a faster track and, and probably easier administratively to do it that way. Okay, so And we have some systems already done, you know, for handling uh, uh, the registration and the membership and the communications and the forms and the logos and all that kind of stuff. And so you would have the patient, the reason we called it patient fishing physician cooperatives is because we expected them to be, there to be many of them or to be a local thing. So what we would say is your PPC Maine, see, or your PPC New York or your PPC Florida, so that we've got a way to sort of co-brand or to make everybody feel comfortable that they're getting something that's available everywhere and gives it some legitimacy and some meaning and uh, without subtracting from the local control and local power because in the end the only members are the members of the doctor's practice I mean that's it right. that's all we're looking for we're not trying to go outside and bring new patients to doctors that's not the purpose of it the purpose of it is to convert patients that somebody has into stable population that pays them more money for less work, but, is, but makes the doctor and patient relationship tighter and longer and stronger and all kinds of things. Yeah. So, so basically, it, could, it can start with a patient who, sure. who decides that this is really a good idea, and then they can... <laughs> Uh, get the documents to form a chapter. Sure. And uh, they can um, then recruit their physician or other physicians to right. to join with them. And the and the a cost to them would be the same in Maine as it would be in. Texas or California or New York or is that is that something that would need to be um... I, ideally the way I would like to see it organized is I would like for us to bring together 20 or 30 primary care physicians in some geographical area and over a period of time the year or so have these physicians enroll their patients in the practice, in their practices under this basis, regardless of who insures these people. It doesn't matter whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, or no insurance at all. Get them all together. Then they're the club. Then they have a lot of strength. Then these patients, we can, we can do the, Then these patients and these primary care physicians can identify and select the very best specialists and the very best facilities that they want to use in their neighborhood. And if they don't have them, then they have the strength to transport people to facilities that are better. That may be out of state. You may fly people around to get really serious things done. But that's the way I would like to see it done, is that every group of about 30 physicians and their patients constitute a self-governing body of people out for their own sake as a cooperative. So it's a very logical kind of uh, uh, development as opposed to trying to put something together that is uh, doctors that are in all different parts of the country and their patients trying to be on the same team. It's better, I think, if it's local than it is if it's like that. 
Is there and you reason? probably have more to say about that than I do. But that's that's my my dream. I, I, and the only reason I say that it works is because. I've been working as the representative for medical groups in contracting with HMOs. And the only ones that have worked very well have been small groups of physicians where there's only 30 or 40 physicians in the, in the program. And the reason is if they have problems and they're trying to deal with the patients, they can get together easily and solve them. And if they're disparate or they don't know each other, it's harder to solve those problems because not everybody has all the information available to them to make the decisions. And there's no relationships between the physicians. So it's, and they need that. It has to be personal. Yeah, it has to be personal. Is there any reason why this can't be done uh, in other countries? Well, it can be done anywhere. In other countries that have done things like this. I mean, there are cooperatives that are working like this around the world. I mean, it's not, it's not a new idea. And you know, we know that there's a number of them in Latin America that are doing that, and and in Europe too, they operate that way. Now sometimes it's under the forced auspices of the state, and that they have a national health insurance program of some kind, and they impose this kind of structure where they assign. I, I recall my Irish physician friend who used to be here in Houston, who who was practicing in Ireland, and he had 780 or something like that, or 900 patients assigned to him. Now, it may have been households or, or families that he was assigned to, and he was paid a monthly fee for taking care of them in Ireland. That was it. If they wanted something else, specialist services, they went to the hospital, and the specialist team was at the hospital, and that's where they got what they needed diagnostically and what have you. But he worked for his first 20 years, I guess, in practice in Ireland under those circumstances. But here's, this, here's so, an, an essential problem is that the way medicine has been done traditionally is the patient is a passive recipient. And in, yeah. unless they are active uh, participants and owners, I personally believe that unless they actually own the organization, then they yeah. don't really have a vested interest in making it work uh, in the ways that are actually best for them and actually best for the physicians as well. But yeah. uh, I, I, this is why I'm trying to sort sort this out in terms of logistics, how it would be done. Because it can't be imposed on the people. There's no question about it. If, they, if they're going to own it, they have to, they have to say, yes, I'm willing to pay a certain amount of money for it because nothing's free. And we're right. talking about a service that actually would be far superior to what they get as passive dependents. Right. So I think it's a small, I don't think uh, a large number of patients are willing to accept that kind of responsibility for themselves in their own health care. But that's okay as long as, as long as there's a critical mass. And, and what is that number? You know, what's the minimum number you need? Well, the doctor in North Carolina that did this, he had probably 4,000 people in his practice between those four physicians, the, the two PAs and the, uh, and the two physicians. And only 780 out of the 4,000 chose to do it this way. But he didn't try to, to give a reason for the other ones to do it. He was, he was picking only on the people that obviously had no insurance or had such high deductibles they couldn't they were paying cash when they came to get services anyway but I think that you could talk all of your patients into doing something like this regardless of whether they have insurance or not because their out-of-pocket expense is such in the insurance both Medicare and and, and uh, Medicaid to the extent that Medicaid doesn't cover certain things or is restrictive you know, there, there, there still be maybe Medicaid patients that would want to have a concierge program as well as what they have. So I would say to the physician that this is a retainer, and all your patients, if they paid you a retainer, then whatever deductibles and coinsurance that they might have from their insurance, that retainer is applied against that, that deductible and coinsurance. So they're not, they're not paying anything that they wouldn't pay anyway. But they're getting rid of the barrier in their mind, the, the psychological barrier 
to staying home when they're sick when they should see a physician, right? And 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 that's what you're trying. That's what we're trying to overcome is the the fault that and then the the fact that a lot of physicians don't have uh, a, a patient base that's stable. They 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 have twenty thousand patient files after twenty years in business, and they're still taking care of fifteen hundred people. Well, why do they have eighteen thousand five hundred more files than they need? Right? Well, because pa patients are going elsewhere all the time. They're leaving all the time, so you're bringing new patients in all the time. Well, that's really disruptive. It's disruptive financially, and it's disruptive medically. So I, I would say that having a retainer program for all of your patient population is the soundest economic decision that a patient and a physician can make. That's the first place to start. And when you do that, what follows is a better relationship, a longer-term relationship, and better health because it takes the stress out of it and it takes some of the contingencies out of it that are that are embedded in the program and the way it is right now. Speaking of the uh, health angle and um, health and healthcare literacy and trying to teach people so that you can uh, focus on the preventive part, uh, does that, do you see that happening more with folks that are involved with this kind of uh, an approach with the cooperative approach are they patients more likely is it just by design or is it by accident that they're more likely to get care early or get preventive care what, what what's happening with that do you notice a, a difference my Mike, the voice is breaking up so badly from you that I can't understand your question okay um do you notice that more, maybe I should type it in? I'll type it in, okay? So what I'm I'm typing, uh, come do the patients come in more for preventive care? Is there more emphasis? Do the patients come more for preventive care? Right. Is there more emphasis on preventive care in the cooperative? Come but you know, I, I don't think that they're coming more for preventive care, nor the emphasis for preventive care is driven by physicians advising patients about that more than it is my observation of what physician, what patients want. The patients still are coming because they have some, they have a complaint about their, they have, they hurt someplace or they don't come. Unless they're, you know, unless they get old and they have pain all the time and so they just get a habit of coming in. But the young people, I don't see them coming very often in spite of that. And the talk about preventive care to me is very interesting in that we've always had contracts with HMOs and they have always wanted to promote preventive care because they could see the long, you know, the, the long vision of that. And that is that uh, if you do preventive things, then you don't have such horrendous problems in the future with the you know, acute care or chronic care. And, but the people that we get to participate in the programs we set up, such as, uh, you know, exercise and eat right and, and lower your stress and all those things, the people that are participating in that are very small percentage, less than 2% of the population that's under 50 years old are participating in any of it. And they're people who participate in it voluntarily already on their own. We would hold exercise classes and diet classes and things like that. And all the people that showed up for them, and this is an HMO that had 25,000 members, right? The people that showed up for it were more expert than the people that were teaching it, right? And more and, and actively participating in, you know, all kinds of bike riding and exercise and diet and knew everything. So they were there to, I guess, show off their, their good health. 
and the people that needed it didn't come. So we don't know if that's the right approach, if preventive health is that sort of thing. We think maybe preventive health might be more about community organization and what you're doing in the neighborhood to create more bridge clubs and more basketball teams and, uh, you know, and more gardening and uh, more walking and things like that, that is about more about community organization. And that could be inspired by the physician and his staff helping to promote those kind of things in the neighborhood. But they got to be in the neighborhood to do that. It's difficult to do programs like this where the physicians are not part of the community that they're working in. And that's in Houston, in the urban areas, that's particularly a problem because a lot of the physicians work all over town in all kinds of uh, areas of town, and they don't live in those areas, and they don't have anything to do with those communities and their organizations. They drive, get in their car and drive away to the other side of town into the gated communities and stay there. So they have no, no real experience or influence on the communities they're working in. So I think that's part of what's got to be straightened out. You really do have to, you know, you have to live where you're working. If in your business, in the kind of business you guys do, you really do need that that touch because you have such a strong impact on what the people in the schools are doing and what the people in the service community is doing generally in that community. Yeah, I know. So that's my, I, I this is what I'm wondering oh, about. The whole business of health and healthcare literacy is not is not just about uh, treating sick people. So, come in. Watch you, I gotta go up. Well, wait on me. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> My son coming in the room. Uh huh. Find out. You said. Is there more emphasis on preventive care than cooperative real food, good food versus fat food? And I, I guess I answered that. Yeah. And the last question, still the voice was broken up, so I couldn't understand the last question you asked me. Right. Health and health care literacy. What is that about? Well, I, I think that it would be a remarkable experiment to see what would happen if a physician had all of his patients enrolled in his cooperative in his neighborhood, and they decided he and his patients to go down to the school board meeting, you know, on Wednesday night, and tell the school board that it's time we started teaching the children in this school in kindergarten some anatomy and physiology and things like that, just like we're teaching them the ABCs and we're teaching them arithmetic. And I, I think that the school board would find that very hard to resist and, and that the curriculums might change, but it's going to take that, science, that cooperative and that physician leadership to cause that to happen. What about patients? It seems to me that there's a small, there is a, a segment, there's probably 5% roughly that really takes uh, uh, health and health care seriously. They, they could be ma big movers in this, and I think that's what participatory medicine is about. It's trying to get the highly motivated people to... Well, if you, if you do what I guess the Cubans did, the only book I read on that subject, and, and uh, make a volunteer committee among your patients that you then teach to be community health workers and then send them out in the community, that will spread that, that, that spirit of what you're talking about. And they, and they seem to have done that rather successfully because they had the first problem was how do we get the physicians to go live in those neighborhoods? And two, once they get there, how do you introduce them around so that everybody respects them and, and, and respects what they're doing? And that health committee turned out to be the way to do it. And it was mostly women in Cuba. It was like 10 women who were volunteers in that area. But they have traditionally been the, the caregivers of, historically in our societies anyway. Uh, the women have been the repository for medicine and, and knowledge about the health and, and, and 
you know, birthing and all kinds of things like that. So maybe that's the approach to take to, to that, the community organization and the community health worker and the spreading out from that, uh, from that field of activity. Yeah, I don't see how uh, this can happen without a highly motivated community. Uh, it's one thing to, to for the physicians to think it's a good idea. Uh, then, even if, if you get 25% of a of a patient population, that's a lot. That's a big. That's a large percentage. So that would be remarkably successful, I would think. Uh, on to start at the other end with healthy people. If we got 5% of that population to push for the same kind of thing, I think that combination would be remarkably successful. But I think it has to come from both ends, personally. I, I, I agree. I, I believe that. And that's, that's why I want to make sure we have ways to... Uh, encourage people so I'm th I'm trying to figure how we should say 20 people came to me and and they're from all over the country and all over the world and said well how can we help make this happen what would we do you know the, the, doing what we're doing now uh, doing a Google hangout uh, this could be done more elaborately and, and, and used uh, to do the kind of communications to spread this. You know, this social media thing is a wonderful way to get that information clearly established. And I think if people know what's really available to them practically, that they can make these kinds of arrangements with their physicians and they can get the kind of medical education they need without any great barriers to doing it, that, uh, that would get some play. So. So spreading the word this way may, may help. And the availability of physicians online to deal with your problems are remarkably uh, helpful. Uh, we added to our benefit package for the cooperative, we added a contract we made nationally with Teladoc, where they have a board-certified physician that answers the phone for anybody that can't reach their doctor. And, uh, and uh, they, they charge us like 50 cents a member month for that service. And there, there's no co-payment for the, for, the, the, uh, for the patient at all. The utilization is under 5% of the population use that, but it is a backup. And they do use it. And then Teladoc is obligated to send those patients back to their primary care physician on our program because we tell them who their primary care physicians are and they can look at it and see, oh, this this is Dr. Masia's patient. So if you need to go to see, I need you to make an appointment, see him tomorrow. See, so that, that was helpful. And yet it's inexpensive enough that it doesn't create a balance on this concierge program at all. But you could be, if you did this more elaborately along the lines of a formal program for teaching community health workers and then some sort of Chautauqua for the patients as well, then, uh, you know, could be really made dynamic and helpful. Well, that, that's something we could, we could do is to schedule regular chats. Uh, and we could certainly um, start to design... Um, programs to teach uh, community health workers, even remotely. Um, it certainly doesn't have to be done in, it could be done in a virtual classroom uh, uh, pretty easily, I think. And we can also train patients and people who are family members who are caregivers. Like you said, most of the, mostly they're women who provide the care. Uh, but I think we should be able to teach anybody uh, in a virtual classroom, it shouldn't be that difficult. And this is probably part of that literacy training. Um, right. And on uh, when you start talking about systems of care and options for uh, taking charge of your health and healthcare, I guess this is this is a part of it. So maybe you and I should work on a curriculum. Well, there's certainly a lot of folks 
besides yourself that are interested in contributing to this. You know, I spoke of, I spoke with Annie about this, and that's my daughter that does the uh, acupuncture and Eastern medicine stuff, and she's, she would contribute. And there are a lot of uh, other physicians that, that are part of what we're doing that are interested in contributing in the same way you're talking about to that education program and establishing a curriculum for people. Well, maybe the best way to do that then would be for those of us who are interested to actually set up a, a, a regular Google Hangout so that we can start talking about this together. Uh, yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah, I think that's, that'd be a good idea. So this, this particular connection that I have with you on my end of it, I think my internet connection at this house today is too slow. So that if you're hearing me, okay, that's fine. But I'm not hearing you except when you type a question, and it, it, it just doesn't come through. But I don't think it's your end of it. So you may be recording your questions on that side without any problem, and I'm not, and I'm not hearing it on this side. Okay. Well, so far I think you catch you're catching the drift uh, of of the conversation. Texted some of it so I could read some of what you were saying. <laughs> But I, I think. But I can. Uh, there's a little delay in the voice and the and the picture uh, coming, and it's because my internet connection is slow. Is what's because I'm using a, a a telephone connection, and it's not it's not fast enough. Okay. But I have a better connection at my office. If we want to try to do this more elaborately or again, then I can set it up so that it's a little stronger. Okay. Well, what what I'll do is, I will share this with the folks who are doing the editing for Society for Participatory Medicine. It is a, okay. you know, we're, it, it's a small group and... Um, yeah, I've got a fast internet connection at my office in addition to a, a better camera and, and, um, and sound and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I could additional. Well, we should plan to meet again. And, okay. And we should also plan to... Um, to set up um, a chat to talk about health and healthcare literacy. I think that would be wise. Yeah, I can't hear you. Oh, uh, that's too bad. <laughs> well, you'll see it, you'll hear it in the recording. <laughs> okay, good. All right, that's good. All right. Is that enough today? I think that's great. That's good. My wife is waiting for me to take me someplace. I don't know where she's going to take me. <laughs> I have to go find out. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank I you, Don. It. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.